Um, that concludes all of the summaries of all of the presentations that are part of this session. Um, before we get started with the panel, I want to take a minute to let Barbara Mullins introduce herself. She is one of the additional panelists in today's session. Barbara, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Barb. Um, I work at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center and also for the Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm a fisheries oceanographer. Thanks very much for inviting me. Great. Thank you. So we've had some questions coming in. And just as a reminder, feel free to submit questions to the chat or the, the Q&A. Um, and we will be answering them live here. So one of the questions we have, this is um, directed at you, Sir Navaz. Um, does India use data from Argo floats deployed by all nations in support of their fisheries research? Um, yes, Kara, uh, uh, sure. Um, India uses uh, data from uh, the floats deployed by uh, all nations. Uh, like India is in Kais, this institute which I represent is also one of the uh, regional Argo data centers uh, in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and then, so we use data from uh, India's floats as well as the floats that are deployed by uh, all countries uh, in the Indian Ocean region. And for that matter, even the uh, floats in the global oceans. So a, a kind of related question to that is that um, given that a lot of the fisheries are in coastal areas that aren't necessarily covered by the BGC floats because of their, their being in deeper waters, how can that uh, how can that data play a role in um, helping in coastal fisheries? Okay, so um, as uh, I, as it's highlighted in one of the case studies in my presentation, uh, which I would briefly uh, repeat here, uh, these observations from the BGC Argo floats are immensely useful in validating and improving the basin-wide numerical models. Uh, now the biogeochemical models that we use, which are coupled with the physical models, they are very important. They play a very important role in uh, fisheries, for, in understanding the fisheries, fish habitats, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, so since the model data is required for areas for parameters where satellites have limitation, for example, the third dimension, especially. Uh, so the, the Argo data, uh, the BGC Argo data that we use in the, even in the open oceans, for example, it gets into these models that are actually, it validates the model data, gets assimilated into the model. So that's one area why uh, it's very important, even the open ocean data from the BGC Argo floats. And the other thing is actually uh, the data from these open ocean Argo floats is also useful in resolving processes within the open ocean uh, uh, sections of the EASY. easy. And uh, fisheries in the open ocean areas around the EASY is less abundant. And then if the fishermen need to be incentivized for actually going for fishing, you know, away from the coastal waters, uh, and that will also reduce the fishing pressure. Uh, so so the, the data from the open ocean Argo floats, BGC Argo floats is very useful. In one study that we did for the yellow fin tuna fishing, for example, uh, which uh, we provide a PFZs for the tunas, and then that's basically based on the oxygen data and the K490 uh, water clarity, et cetera. Uh, so many fishermen have been incentivized, actually. They go, uh, they have actually converted their bottom trawlers, coastal bottom trawlers into long liners, uh, you know, going for open ocean fishing. So that's another incentive which we could provide by using data from open ocean Argo floats. So the, the, uh, the implications of open ocean process uh, to the coastal waters, it cannot be understated. So the, the, uh, the forecast of algal blooms, which are in the open oceans, and then combining them with uh, you know, satellite observations, uh, combining with them with uh, biogeochemistry in the open oceans, it's all very linked to coastal processes. For example, what happens in the open ocean in the, uh, in the Arabian Sea, for example, it actually causes a lot of deoxygenation in the coastal waters. So all of these are very linked. So we can easily use uh, this data, open ocean BGC Argo data for, uh, beneficially for coastal processes. Great. Yes, please do. Yeah, yes. It's always hard to have a, a panel on remotely, but yeah, just just adding on to what Srinivasa just said, you, you know, a, a typical water parcel in the coastal ocean usually only stays there for a few months to a year before it's replaced by by water from the open ocean, and 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 so any attempt to anticipate what the coastal ocean is going to do 
over a time scale of, of, of a few months to a few years, the, the most useful time scales that, that Alistair highlighted for, uh, for fisheries applications really requires information about, you know, what, what are the properties of that ocean water that's going to be coming in and reshaping that coastal system. And, and the largest memory that exists in that offshore water is in those subsurface oxygen and nutrient fields that BGC Argo is measuring. So um, really just underlining Srinivasa's points there. But um, you know, if you want to know what happens in the coast, you have to observe what's going to happen along its boundaries because that's the water that's going to be replacing what's at your coast today. Great, thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, Barbara? No. Um, I think Srinivasa and Charlie made the points that I would have made. Thank you. Okay. One of, one of the points that Srinivas brought up was the um, EEZ or the Exclusive Economic Zone. Um, and what, that was actually one of the questions we had uh, was about how it works. Um, is it necessary for international cooperation and, and what's involved with collecting data in the EEZ? Can anyone uh, talk about that? Um, if not, I know Ken can. Ken, can you jump in and, and talk to that? Uh, yeah, th thank you, Kara. This is Ken Johnson. I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of, of BGC Argo. Uh, so so uh, under the uh, IOC, the UN's um, uh, Agency for uh, Ocean uh, Management and Administration, the very profiling floats may operate may drift into another nation's EEZ. Um, and if the nation does not formally object, those floats can continue to collect data and transmit it to the, to the world. All Argo data is publicly available. A nation can ask uh, a BGC float to be turned off if it is in their EEZ, that very seldomly happens. But uh, the, the, the advantage is that we don't have to file for international clearance like you do for a research vessel cruise when a, when a float goes into another, another nation's EEZ. So uh, much like meteorological data, the biogeochemical data um, is, is considered equivalent and um, can in most cases be uh, collected and transmitted. Thank you. Great, thank you for that, Ken. Um, we have another question that's very relevant to the things that Srinivas was talking about, and that is, are fishing vessels ever instrumented with biogeochemical sensors as well? Um, Cara, do, do you want uh, me to take that question or was it? Uh... I, I think it would be most appropriate to, but um, also if Charlie and Barbara want to uh, chime in as well, but yes, if you can take the first stab at it, that would be great. All right. So most of the coastal fishing vessels, uh, Cara, in India, for example, they are, like I said, mostly traditional vessels, and then they are not instrumented with any, uh, most of them are fishing vessels are not instrumented with any biogeochemical sensors. But most of the biogeochemical data that we get from our, uh, you know, from the uh, in situ observations is basically from the cruises that are conducted by scientific uh, institutions and ministries such as uh, inquiries. Uh, so, yeah, to, to answer your question in short, no, a lot of fishing vessels don't carry biogeochemical sensors, unfortunately. <laughs> Char Charlie or Barbara, do you, do you or? Does your daughter Charlie uh, want to uh, give, a, give an input on how that uh, perspective of how that is in the United States? No, I think she just wants a snack. But uh, uh, the um, yeah, about Barb, why don't you hop in first, and I'll I'll go last on this one. Sure. Um, short answer is I'm not aware any of any for the U.S. Although I could be wrong, I'm not familiar with all of the fleet. Um, it's very common for vessels to be equipped with temperature sensors. Um, we have had some informal discussions about how data streams like that might be transferred um, to scientists, but I'm not aware of any data streams being transferred at the moment. But perhaps if that became more common in the future, that might give us a way to start getting more data exchange between the fishing vessels and the scientists. Yeah, and my experience is largely consistent with Barb's. And that there, there, I think there's a lot of partnerships on the physical front. Um, you know, there's thermistors on lobster pots and things like that. Uh, 
uh, not as much on the BGC front, although the ones I'm aware of, um, yeah, there are several cases where, where ferries making regular trips across certain routes have been outfitted with, with biogeochemical measurements uh, to try and augment uh, the observational capacity. There was one from, uh, from Maine to Nova Scotia that for many years was, was outfitted with some BGC measurements. So there's, there's proof of concepts out there that we could build on. But, but I think an important point to, to keep in mind with all of this is that even, even those ships that do have that, is that those are basically gonna be data they're getting from an inflow system. So again, it's just gonna be a surface measurement. So it's not gonna give you that subsurface component, which is really what we're getting from BioArgo. I mean, the real value in it is getting that subsurface information. Um, that brings us to a question we had from the audience, which really gets to the heart of, of everything we're talking about here. Uh, the question being, are subsurface data from floats really necessary for fisheries management? How will this improve on satellite observations that capture most of the globe? So here's the question. This is the, <laughs> the meat of the argument. So who, I, I think we can all speak to this one. Who wants to go first? Um, I can say a couple of things to start us off. Great, um, thank you. Yeah, I think we all acknowledge how amazing the surface satellite data are. But um, something that's really valuable about the, the three-dimensional um, data is that it starts to give us some information about the habitats of particularly some of these highly migratory species like tunas, like billfish, that support these really valuable fisheries um, in the high seas and in the EZs of some countries. Um, if you think back to the summary of Mike Secchi's presentation, where he was showing this sort of um, hole in catch for big eye tuna in the tropical um, eastern Pacific. And we know that that area is where the oxygen um, decreases quite quickly with depth. We have some observations there, but as he pointed out, we don't really have a good understanding of the dynamics of this area. And so to understand where the most productive fishing grounds are, and also to understand how these species respond to changes and variability in the oxygen, in the prey fields, in the deep chlorophyll maximum within these areas, we need some more of these three-dimensional measurements. At the moment, researchers like me, like others, who are trying to understand how these highly migratory species use these areas, why they go to one area in one year and then shift to another one the next year. We're often using climatologies. We're using very, very sparse shipboard measurements. Um, so I think that's where something like BDC Argo could come in useful. We're not only gonna be able to characterize sort of the climatology of these areas, but also the variability within these areas and hopefully the future change. Great, thank you, Barbara. Charlie? Yeah, uh, um, just adding on uh, uh, one more dimension, you know, I think, um, you know, most of the, the, the ocean's memory is, is in its subsurface waters. And so a, a lot of surface properties, you know, sort of get washed away by, by, by weather scale noise relatively quickly, but these subsurface biogeochemical signals uh, can propagate across ocean basins and, and, and pop up in predictable ways in places that really matter for fisheries. So um, I'm really excited about what the VGC Argo will allow us to do in terms of, of being able to anticipate environmental change, fisheries relevant environmental change. I do think that there's a there's a bar to, to leap over there and that is uh, BGC Argo should be able to provide us more information than we could gain through just observation of the physical properties alone. And, and, and so that, that's going to be a measure of, of added value for those sort of uh, prediction applications that we're going to have to um, de delve into in more detail as we move forward. Um, Srinivas, anything you wanted to add to that question, which was again uh -huh. just asking why we need to get the subsurface information. Yeah, probably I'll just be, you know, uh, reiterating what Bob and uh, Charlie said, actually, it's very important from the perspective of, uh, you know, several parameters that impact fisheries and fish habitats, like for example, the uh, oxygen, uh, you know, the deep chlorophyll maxima, et cetera. And uh, we've, we've done a study, one study, which actually led us to uh, the, the, the uh, very interesting finding 
um, that is basically from the BGC Argo data, the oxygen float uh, that uh, you know showed that the tuna habitat is prone to be much narrower and smaller. Uh, they actually try to move in corridors uh, uh, than previously assumed. And then this is basically uh, you know, using the Argo, uh, the, the BGC oxygen data from the BGC floats. And then this information also helped us actually, you know, in developing the three dimension in our PFZ advisory saying, okay, how deep should the hooks be cast, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, do a much efficient fishing. So, I mean, uh, so I'm just trying to reiterate uh, what uh, others said, other experts said, yes, it's very important. Great. Uh, here's another question that uh, I, I think um, you would be poised well to answer, um, and it is how would how would poorer nations benefit from BGC Argo in relation to fisheries? And the sort of flip side of that question is, would it would this data allow larger nations to dominate the fisheries to the detriment of poorer nations? So how you know how how would this data play out to different um, different nationalities in terms of fisheries? Okay, Kara. So, um, yeah, and by poorer, I would I, I would actually say it's uh, you know uh, with less capacity. Uh, I would say I would put it that way uh, in in using the data because in some sense the Argo data is kind of open and then it is available. It's out there, uh, you know, for anybody to you know uh, use it actually. And then the the technologies that we are talking about for fisheries again, these are technologies that have been. Uh, that are out there, you know, they've been in existence for about 20, 25 years. If not with Argo flow data, you know, the uh, satellite data has been used for fishing for, for several decades now. So the technology is, I think, out there. So in that sense, it's there for people to use. And the next question is actually, you know, the capacity. You know, I think uh, it's, it, it's the, the, the important thing is to enhance the capacities of countries uh, who don't have those capacities to be able to use this data that is out there and the techniques uh, technologies that are out there. And then the other question, uh, related question that I keep getting asking is get, get, uh, getting asked sometimes is, are we actually uh, you know, uh, exploiting uh, more uh, and then things like that. But I think these, are, these techniques should go hand in hand, hand, in hand with you know, other management aspects uh, you know, the quotas and all, especially. Um, and then also these techniques, for example, in India, we use it for, you know, sustainability uh, aspects as well. Like, for example, uh, with these techniques, we know where, uh, you know, we don't provide information in, you know, breeding seasons or we, we are places we know where, you know, fish are, is there more harvested. So I think this uh, aspect of, uh, you know, capacities and then, uh, how people use, should use this technology. I think it's mostly related to, uh, you know, capacities, Kara. Uh, uh, and uh, other thing is actually, I would also take like to take a parallel here. Uh, you know, when India, for example, got into the Argo program, that was way back in 2002, I remember, that was the, you know, standard Argo, temperature salinity Argo. Um, we, we were not uh, utilizing this data when we got into the program, but over, over the period of time. Now, all this data, the, the data that, that I also mentioned before that the floats we deploy and then the floats everybody deploys, all this data gets assimilated operationally into ocean models. So I think it's just, uh, I, I, I would like to answer it that way. It's just the capacities. Barbara or Charlie, do you wanna add anything to that? If, if not, there's another question that kind of builds upon that. You know, I guess uh, having, having watched Srinivas's uh, great presentation the other day, I'll just encourage people to watch that. One of the things that struck me was um, the the value of your PFZs to um, you know unpowered vessels and, and and making them not have to spend as much time at sea, being more efficient about their their uh, fishing activities. I found that to be really compelling in the numbers that 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 were that were uh, reported about reduction in time at sea and and sort of the the safety issues that that entails. And so as you were talking, that, that was just resonating in my head from your talk the other day was in many ways, if, if this led to more and more effective PFZs, there might be added advantages if people are using boats that might not be, you know, 
150 foot trawlers capable of withstanding uh, severe weather, uh, but uh, fishing vessels that are much more vulnerable to um, uh, to poor conditions. So, um, yeah, just underlining something that Sweet has said very eloquently in his talks. So, <laughs> um, definitely encourage people to listen to that. Yeah, not, not too much to add, I guess, just to keep in mind that even though things like BGC Argo and satellite measurements are fabulous in that they're, you know, free around the globe, then we still need to keep capacity in mind, especially when you're collaborating across countries. Yes, so the capacity, um, actually, that brings up a question we had, uh, and that is, will there be a commitment to help train scientists and managers, particularly those from other countries? And if none of our panelists have any um are comfortable saying something like that i think i will um hit ken up to respond to that first at least ken uh yeah, I yeah. <laughs> thanks again so uh i put in in the chat for for there is a workshop coming up june 28 to 30 to train scientists mostly focused in scientists less so for managers but how to access argo data how to use it um, there will be uh, uh sessions using uh, uh public domain software like python um so that uh people can can read the data use it um, so that's really focused on training scientists but i think you know, as Srina Voss has pointed out, there is a, a tremendous capacity of open source data out there. It can make nations, the fisher, fishers and other nations much more efficient. And so the, 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 there needs to be, you know, uh, some incentive at the management and fisheries level to start training, um, increasing the capacity for people to use the data. There is a, a comment, an unanswered question up here that, you know, more more fishing may mean overfishing. And that's a that's a genuine concern. And as Srina Voss has said, you're really aiming for sustainability, right? And so uh, there is a saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. We're trying, you know, we're trying to add, you know, more measurements so people can manage their fisheries much more much more efficiently, but this is this really is a challenge, and and we need as international groups to commit to um, making this happen. And this workshop really is is part of that, is to you know start start the process of um, you know bringing the Argo data to managers of all types, fisheries, carbon, so on. So um, we we need to do so, this. A question about the workshop, Ken. So. I know like so for this workshop, you're having the two live sessions to try to, um, you know, have as much international participation as possible. Will the workshop in June be doing something similar? I mean, or will it be asynchronous or, or how will it work if people who are, you know, not in U.S. time zones, um, you know, how how convenient will it be for people to participate? Yeah, we uh, this, this <laughs> it, it, it's going to be at a single time, uh, I believe, 10 Pacific time uh but you, you're right if, the, if there were demand the 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 you know there needs to be then a you know a, a more global um effort to you know, set timing for uh for the uh um other half of the world but but it is going to be a more conventional one one time one session uh workshop over over three days but one one time of day each day uh, and that that workshop in, in, is uh, you. I'll put it back in the uh, uh, chat to everyone. Usocb.org. Great, thank you, Ken. Any of the panelists want to chime in on any of that? No. Okay. Um, um, just yes. just a comment, Cara. Sorry. Um, yes. No. So no. I yeah, so on the capacity building, I would also like to draw the attention of the attendees to, especially in the Indian Ocean region, uh, there are two uh, category two centers, training centers of the UNESCO, uh, and which are operated under the auspices of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. And one of that happens to be in, in India uh, at INCOIS uh, in Hyderabad, which actually runs uh, several courses a year. Uh, on operational oceanography aspects. It's called the International Training Center for Operational Oceanography. It is one of the uh, regional training centers under the Ocean Teacher Global Academy of the IOC UNESCO. 
Um, so so, so uh, there are several courses that are run on fisheries, on data management, Argo data management in specific, and various other ocean services like the ocean state forecasting, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, I can, uh, I can provide links to the uh, websites and then there are courses announced there always. And now um, most of the courses are being done online. Of course, in, in the normal time, uh, there would be uh, you know, people coming into inquiries and working hands-on, listening to lectures, but then now most of that is happening online. Thank you. Okay, so here we have another question, um, keeping with kind of fishing vessels, is is there any future potential in BGC Argo float deployment from fishing vessels um, to sort of grow a collaboration between scientists and fishermen? Um, I would say that I'm not aware of any of these, but um, I would point out that, well, you know, there's been collaborations with fishing vessels before to do things like deploy archival tags on fish. And so we have worked together before. I guess the main issue is that a float is a lot larger and heavier than an archival tag. And I guess if you're asking a fisher to give up a particular fishing trip to do scientific work, um, you need to obviously pay them to make it worth their while and have them be offshore enough that the float is deployed in a useful location. And one of the main arguments for the BGC Argo is it starts to fill in these sampling gaps. And so it would depend if there's fishes in your sampling gaps or if it's really a gap for fishes and for scientific samples. Charlie? Yeah, um, I, I just said uh, there was one question that that we sort of uh, uh, flew by quickly about more data meaning more fishing that I thought might be good to uh, discuss a little bit. And and um, if, if that's okay. Yes, please and, and do. If the, the key point that, that I'd like to stress is that you know a lot of these fisheries that techniques like this are being um, applied to are, are quota based management and, and, and a lot of the uh, utility of the data is linked to trying to you know catch that quota in the most efficient and safe way possible um, and and of course, a lot of the other examples are really highlighting how that added information can simultaneously improve both fisheries and conservation goals. And that sounds like it may be violating some conservation law, but the key here is that you have new information so you can make better decisions that are simultaneously maximizing those, those you know, two goals of, of conservation and productive fisheries and economies. And so I don't think that more data necessarily means more fishing in all cases. In cases where you're below the maximum sustainable yield and you can handle a little bit more, yes, maybe, but certainly not in all cases. Um, this data is gonna be applied across fisheries management in, in both a conservation and a fisheries context. Yeah, I, I just want to second what Charlie said. And um, the way that these live sessions are going, um, I mean, we have Serena Vaz in this session, so we're, I'm sort of focusing a lot of the questions around the, the harvesting aspect, but uh, if, if you can, if you can tune into the live session this afternoon, um, I think there will be a lot more discussion about the conservation and management aspects. Um, so, and that, that really is, you know, that, that's a big part of, of what we're talking about as well. Um, but as Charlie said, in these fisheries that are quota management, if, if there's the quota in place, then you're really helping to just have more efficient fishing. So, and, and really, I encourage you to, to look at Serena Va's presentation where he does talk about how, you know, having data about where the fish are helps you to have, um, do it more efficiently, do it safer. You don't have to go out in badder weather. So it, it, there's, um, you can save fuel costs, so it actually d does it, you know, in a greener way. So um, there's, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're that we're catching more fish. We're just doing it more efficiently. And I guess as the small example in Charlie's presentation mentioned, there's some move towards also using these products to avoid bycatch. So if you're in a fishery where, if you say interact with a certain number of protected animals, you know that has impacts on the ability of fishers to fish. It can also help your fishery to become more efficient, not only in maximizing what you want, but minimizing what you don't want. 
And, and, and just uh, another point that I would like to add here is an example where um, in, a, in a village of about 50, 60 fishing trawlers, about more than half of them converted into, you know, long liners. You know, the coastal bottom trawling is not very sustainable, as we all know. But then, you know, converting them into long liners, which actually go out into the sea and conduct, you know, pelagic fishing operations. And then this actually, this technology becomes an incentive for fishermen to do this. I mean, otherwise they won't actually uh, want to go offshore if, if they, they wouldn't know that they, 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 they don't know how to get, uh, you know, fishing uh, catch. But then now with this, they're actually also converting their bottom, uh, you know, trawlers into long liners. That was a very good uh, case study that we actually, um, you know, documented in one of the villages uh, in India. So, so like others said, and uh, like with, with, with our long experience with uh, this technology and working very closely with the NGOs and the fishers, it actually, uh, you know, enhances the economics of fishing operation. We are not necessarily uh, harvesting more than the sustainable yield. We are doing it in a much more greener way, putting lesser, spending less diesel, putting less carbon, and then the safety of the fishermen. So I think this is this. I would like to sum it up this way: our experience with this technology and the data. Great. Um, I'm going to move on to one more, another question about um, uh, sort of sampling, and that is how important is the sampling fisheries with respect to fisheries applications? So the fact that these floats take measurements on uh, every ten days. Is that sufficient, or you know, would it be better that do we need data on a um, more frequency? Um, you know, there's no way to get the dial uh, um, variations. Anybody want to speak to that? Can I can I nominate Barb? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I just, wow. Okay. I can see your brain percolating there, Barb, but I I know you. If I thought about this uh, more than most. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess with whatever sampling mechanism you're using at sea, there's always going to be a trade-off. Um, and it depends on the system that you're studying, and it depends on the, the species that is fished by the fishery that you're trying to support as well. Um, having some estimates of um, DL processes in some systems would be great. But I think for many of the species that we're interested in, I guess more in the open ocean, I'm biased there, um, we probably wouldn't need something on a time scale quite that fine. I guess also, as Charlie pointed out, when you get deeper down in the water column, you don't get that really, really high frequency change quite so much. So some of those properties are better conserved. Um, yeah, I guess that's probably my main points on the subject. I, don't have a, I haven't given this um, as much thought um, as I probably should, but I guess the prospect of moving beyond a long-term climatology to anything of higher frequency um, was for me pretty exciting. So 10 days sounds fabulous. Srinivas, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I would, I would. I think I would agree with Bob, and uh, I think as of now, the the number of profiles, uh, a number of floats, uh, I think is what matters much more than the actual, uh, you know, the the sampling frequency. I guess. Uh, so we need more and more floats, and then uh, so I, and in the coming years, when the floats are much more common, then actually I think you have these floats popping up, uh, you know, at different times. So you have reasonable data to actually put into your models or you know validate your models that assimilate into your model so i guess uh, the 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 10 day sampling i think it should be okay at this point in time the number of floats and the uh, profiles is more that matters i guess but more sampling like uh, you know like for some processes like for example you want to study the uh, study the uh, impact of a cyclone on uh, you know the biogeochemistry on the oxygen or say for example on the chlorophyll or the dcm uh, then probably you would uh, you know you would want to study so those kind of features then probably you might want to 
have a much higher frequency, but I, otherwise I think for most of the other problems at this moment, I think 10 days looks to be okay to me. Yeah. I mean, the part, the part of this that I, I work, I wonder about a little bit is, is, is the fisheries observation side. And you know, there's a famous quote by, a, a, I just Googled it, it's attributed to John Shepard, who's a fishery scientist, but he said, you know, counting fish is like counting trees, except they're invisible and they move all the time. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, as I think about how to, how to link these in, enhanced environmental data streams to fisheries, I, I sometimes think about the other half of that challenge, which is, you know, you've got this great environmental data, but do you have the, the, the fish observations on commensurate scales in order to, to fully take advantage of that? There's certainly enough to take advantage of it, but you kind of wonder what the next advance on the fishery side might be to really fully realize that potential. And I'm not sure what that is. While we're talking about um, sampling, a, a question that came up in a, a comment in the, the chat was that um, somebody was saying they, they thought it, it seemed like we were saying we don't need chips anymore because we, if we have this data from BioArgo. And I, I think it's really important to stress that. And if you look at all the presentations, I think almost everybody stressed this, that the BioArgo data is seen as a, a complement to satellite data because it can get the subsurface a complement to ship data. And it's it's not a replacement for ship data, certainly, it, it's a complement. You know, we need all of these things to get a synergistic view of the ocean. Um, but thinking beyond that, that, that the bio-argo data could possibly be used to change how we do our sampling. Um, you know, having this information, would it change the way we do ship surveys? Um, do any of you wanna speak to that question? Um, sure, I give a couple of thoughts. Um, I guess for this one, like you said, I don't think BDC Argo will be a replacement for shipboard sampling. The data that you can get when you're actually out there on the water sampling is very difficult to replicate from any sort of unmanned platform. But having said that, I think that the BDC Argo could represent a really exciting way to start adding value to these sorts of cruises. Um, so I think that some of the, the best studies which have really improved our understanding of certain ecosystems have been these sort of larger scale multidisciplinary studies that have sort of started with the oceanography and then kept going up trophic levels. And so if you have Argo floats, you have this um, really exciting opportunity to not only perhaps sample to complement what the Argo floats are telling you, to say, all right, you know, we see this in three dimensions from the Argo floats. You know, if we drop a probe, if we drop a CTD, if we drag a net, what's actually there? What's the float actually showing us? And so that would be a really exciting thing to be able to do. Um, in some systems, when there's enough floats, um, we could even start to um, target sampling to be around these floats to try and understand smaller scale processes. That at the moment, we don't really have a good um, a good understanding of. So in pre-cruise planning, they could be really um, useful for that. And I guess overall, just to extend our understanding beyond the cruise snapshots, which I think have moved us a long way forward in the past, but, you know, a ship can only be out for a few weeks. And that tends to only happen in many systems every few years, every few decades. And so I think the best way to think of it is how the two can complement each other. Yeah, when you think about it, sampling the vast ocean isn't that much different than trying to catch a fish in the, in the vast ocean, right? In the sense that you, you're kind of going out trying to figure out how do I best sample and characterize this environment given a limited number of days and a limited number of observations that I can take. If you have BGC Argo out there, if it's being integrated into ocean state estimates that include biogeochemistry, then you can really rethink what your strategy is for, for how to how do I fully characterize the system given the constraints I have with shipboard sampling? And um, that could be, could be quite powerful, I think. Yeah, one of the things I'd like to add about that, I mean, one of the things, you know, real advantages I see with the, the BioArgo is its ability, of course, to sample year round. I mean, there's certainly, there's places in the ocean where you, you can't go out and sample in the middle of the winter. 
Um, and so it's to, to be able to get that sort of sustained measurements throughout the year is really um, is really valuable, even though obviously you cannot get the suite of measurements that you're going to get when you go out there on a ship, which is why it's complementary. Um, none of these systems, satellites, bio Argo ships um, do exactly the same thing, which is why we need all of them. Anything you want to add to that, Serena Buzz? Um, I totally agree. I mean, they're all complementary satellite, you know, these kind of autonomous profilers and shipboard measurements. I think we can't replace one with the other. They're all complementary. I agree with all of you. That segues nicely into, are there more or different sensors that, that we need to link ocean biogeochemistry to higher trophic levels or marine food webs? Um, so are there sensors that are not considered part of the suite of, of BGC Argo, which is nitrate, oxygen, chlorophyll, um, pH, there's one or two I'm forgetting. Um, are, there, are there still other things? So, um, one thought is that you know, you know whether whether they're uh, acoustic or, or optical technologies backscatter that might be able to give more of a sense of, of a you know biomass of, of of organisms that move up the trophic chain. And I, and I don't know what the you know the power calculations or the the instrument instrumentation um, implications are for that, but it, it sort of speaks to the comment of you know, you know, if we're trying to infer things about those upper trophic levels, can we push BGC Argo to provide us more direct information about the biomass of whether it's phytoplankton, zooplankton, or, or fish? Um, uh, but that said, you know, I, I would say that what it's doing now would be exactly where I would start, uh, oxygen, nutrients, and, um, and carbon system properties. And so, yeah, it'd be great to push up the trophic levels a bit more, but, um, but we're, I think we're starting in the right place. Yeah, I don't have any, um, I don't have any ideas which seem possible with current technology, but in terms of pie in the sky ideas, I mean, imagining some sort of imaging system, imagining, you know, a video, imagining even getting to something to the point of the, the ichthyoplankton in situ imaging system, which I think comes out of Bob Cowan's lab at OSU. Um, yeah, several years into the future, that could be something really exciting to get into. But with current technology, I mean, the current suite of sensors, um, to me, looks looks fabulous. Srinivas, you want to add anything? Um, I'm good, Kara. OK. Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, uh, somebody asked if it would be possible to put an acoustic fish finder on a float. Ken, yeah. might, Ken might be more equipped to answer that than any of us. In, in, I think somebody. he would be, Ken. Can we have an acoustic fish finder, please? Um, uh, hi. Yeah, um, I actually, I, I, I asked that question of, of the fishery people. I mean, it, it's entirely possible. They're, they're reasonably low power. The float does the profiling for you. Uh, as, as I asked my colleagues this question, they all go, yeah, but you, you need the net toe to tell you what the fish finder is sampling. You know, all you know is return, but that's still, you, you would get profiles of acoustic backscatter, right? Um, is that really gonna be helpful? Um, and then the, the, the related question, there is a, a big push, particularly in uh, the EU and also in Australia to start deploying floats with a device called an underwater vision profiler. There are half a dozen floats in the water now with UVPs. They, uh, UVP gets you up to, particle size distributions up to maybe a couple of millimeters, essentially into the zooplankton um, sort of size range. So that that maybe is coming down the road. So uh, we have the basics, but but getting to zooplankton and above really does seem, seems like there are possibilities. How valuable would it be? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, my sense is that it would be valuable. I mean, there's obviously a lot of, of uh, you know, details about, you know, relating backscatter to, to, to what you're actually scattering against and so forth. But, uh, but it is, a, it is a, that additional information stream, you know, were it feasible at re relatively low cost, I'm sure the cost benefit would, would probably work out. Were it a, a tremendous cost, then, then, yeah, you know, there may be higher priority um, higher priority things to do, but that's that's uh, that's exciting to hear. That's like uh, you know science. Well, that gets back to the problem of counting fish and, and counting trees, right? Um, so that would be fantastic, like science fiction kind of stuff. So <laughs> it's great. I should have mentioned earlier when I was mentioning the the suite that we're measuring is the that the optical instruments. Um, are you know providing information about the base of the food web from the the backscatter and the POC and some particle dynamics? So we are getting more than just the the nutrients and oxygen. Well, we have five minutes left. I think this has been a really excellent session, um, and I think I will uh, end the session with a sort of far kind of big big picture. And what do we think we could better understand in 20 years as a result of having a global VGC float array. So what, what will we know then that we don't know now um, after, after this array is established? So I, I can have a go at, at that, maybe a little bit through my GFDL lens, but um, you know, when, when we when we build prediction systems about, you know, trying to, which are really about testing our understanding of the ocean, right? Anytime you do an ocean prediction, you're really testing, uh, you know, your, your understanding. If your understanding is good, you might be able to predict it. If not, you won't. And, and you know, with, with the systems we build now, we're, we're really limited to, to looking at, you know, surface properties and, and, uh, and, and a little bit of subsurface physics. I, you know, I, I kind of look at this BGC Argo uh, array over 20 years or so, and we have really created a, a time series of of the ocean state over the top 2,000 meters of, of, of the ocean is really, a, you know, enhancing our capacity to to understand the way the ocean fluctuates and our capacity to predict it. And then, of course, you know, linking it to fisheries is just that logical next step, and hopefully leading us to more mechanistic models of those. Uh, ocean fisheries linkages that we can rely on in a fisheries context. And, you know, that, that's something we haven't talked about too much during this session, but, you know, one of the real barriers for, for getting this into fisheries management is trying to, to really establish the reliability of some of these uh, relationships. And so, um, well, that's too many things, I guess, but uh, yeah. <laughs> understanding ocean prediction and being able to apply it fruitfully to fisheries management, I think it could have a role to play. It's not, you know, it's not panacea. It's not blockchain for the ocean that's going to solve all our problems, right? It's, 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 but it can be a critical piece of the puzzle, I think. Serena Vars or Barbara, you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, so so I think what uh, the 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 standard Argo with the temperature salinity sensors did to ocean general circulation modeling, the modeling the physics, the heat and mass transport. Uh, today we are in a much better situation, you know, into assimilating those data into the ocean general circulation models, and then you know coming up with uh, very good predict prediction systems that are running all around the world, actually, centers like GFDL and, you know, other centers, you know, like in COIS, you know. Now, I think what the BGC Argo data, which I, what I expect will do is the same thing, actually, you know, 20 years down the line, uh, we might certainly be in a very good position to, you know, resolve the, uh, the, uh, the biogeochemistry, the BGC models, and then uh, hopefully also link it to the higher trophic level models and then we'll be able to you know as efficiently as we are uh, i mean uh, as uh, better i would say uh, the way we are doing the uh, physics uh, you know the, with the general circulation models probably we'll be in a situation uh, in a similar situation with the uh, biogeochemistry and the fisheries uh, modeling 
uh, forecasting. Great. Yeah, to, to add to the great points from Srinivasar and Charlie, um, I think what I see would be just a really enhanced ability to understand the mechanism of the offshore ocean. A lot of our species of interest for fisheries use um, how they're actually using the habitat in three dimensions out there, how they're foraging on features such as the deep chloroform axis, the deep scattering layer, which we don't have a great ability to model at the moment. Probably upset the modelers saying that. Um, but then eventually to be able to, um, to anticipate how changes in this environment might drive the distributions and the productivity of these fish and fisheries in the future. So instead of retroactively studying a big shift that took us by surprise to actually start to anticipate some of these changes. Great. Thank you. Well, we are half past the hour. Um, so we've been at this for 90 minutes. So I think with this, I will conclude this session. I would like to thank, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and the panelists. Um, as well as the audience for the participation in today's session. And if you didn't, if you still want more, remember there will be a session this afternoon. Um, so that will be at 2300 UTC. Um, so you can do the math, what that is in your time zone. It's four o'clock in California, California time. Um, and we will probably be talking more about conservation um, and fisheries management at that session, just because the presenters um, that will be on the, the panel at that time. If you didn't have a chance to check out the the uh, full presentations for today's sessions, I encourage you to do that because they are they are still online. Um, I also encourage you to um, think about next week's panel. Next week, there's going to be uh, the panel will be on carbon budget verification, and so those presentations are online. And so hopefully, you will come back for that. And again, thank you very much for coming, and um, thank you for your interest in GoBGC, and get the data, use the data, have fun with it. Or if you're in a position to do so, convince your country to buy more floats and add to the array. Thank you very much. <laughs>